Thank you very much, Albert, and thank you very much for Thermo to inviting me to be here and to try to tell you a little bit of story of how my lab has been in the past few years. And in fact, I will, although my title has a question, I will not answer that question. I think the idea is that you, in the end, will try to answer the question for, for yourself. So the, the, the way we start is just to present a little bit where I'm from. So I'm from the western part of, the, of Europe, in Portugal, in the, on the second biggest city in Porto. This is a very nice picture there. And I'm part, I'm a researcher at this institute, a Molecular Pathology Institute in Porto. This is the leading research institute in Portugal here. And very recently funded, <clears throat> together with other two institutes, the biggest research health institute in Portugal, which harbors nowadays close to 1,300 researchers at the same time. Um, it's not only focused on cancer, which is the main activity there, but also neurosciences and host pathogen interactions, with a lot of interface research within these, two, um, these three research lines. Of course, Ipatimup is almost 30 years old, and since the beginning there was a, a a question, a need from the, from the institute to, since we are um, receiving money from our taxes in Portugal, there was also a need to provide something back to the community, and that's where Ipatimup Diagnostics really sets his, his foot. He's trying to provide services in the area of surgical pathology, cytopathology, genetic diagnosis, and molecular pathology, at, in services that are mostly not present in the country. One thing that is extremely important for us is quality. And from the beginning, we've been involved in various laboratory accreditation systems, both from CAP, the American College of Pathology, but also nowadays by using the ISO 15189 for genetic tests and also the 17025 for um, forensic tests. It's also implemented in the routine testings that we provide in the, in the, in the laboratory. We are sort of a medium-sized uh, laboratory. We've been increasing in the past years. Apologies, this is a very old slide, but you, it's just for you to get an idea that the number of tests is increasing. We nowadays are reaching almost 40,000 tests per year. Still, the vast majority is on standard pathology. Only molecular diagnosis is really increasing nowadays, mostly because of the, what we call the molecular mutation screening, and this is where molecular pathology really plays and this is where next generation sequencing really was a boost, and you will hear more in the end. This is really increasing every year, which uh, this year, I think we will easily reach the 5,000 cases. <clears throat> Not only we do provide services for national-wise, but we are also referred by international consultation, and this is just a picture of what the different countries that come to us to pro for us to ask for services or for second opinions from our group of pathologies and molecular pathologies that we have in the lab. So this was just for you to get a picture of what, what is the setting where our NGS was actually thought to, to be implemented. And this is where this timeline will start to show up here. This is because next generation sequencing came to us very early in the process of NGS. And the major driver or the major motivation then was to increase speed of results. So turnaround time for us was really important. This was actually one of our goals initially, was to reduce this turnaround time of 10 to 12 weeks much shorter. For that, we acquired an INPGM, which was one of the first in Europe, the first in Portugal, but one of the first in Europe. And quickly after the introduction of the, uh, the INPGM and with the automation of templating, we e easily, less than a year later, re reduced four times the turnaround time. So clearly, next generation sequencing in the lab after validation clearly and easily helped us reduce turnaround time of the tests. This was further than implemented and with more capacity of sequencing, with more tests being shuffled from Sanger sequence to NGS, we started to increase not only, or decrease not only the turnaround time, but by 2013, the number of samples that we were providing by test, so our measure of capacity of sequencing really also increased. So by two years, two years later, we were 
providing more results at a much shorter time. Of course, once you have the technology implemented, you want more. So what we wanted more was then to do not only more tests by having, by having more sequencers and having more capacity, but we also wanted to have more, provide more comprehensive genetic tests. And this came because, as you all know, and this, this conference has been um, a landmark in this aspect, is that the number of biomarkers that every year, every month comes into play that needs to be assessed is increasing every time. So more and more biomarkers are needed to be um, uh, assessed, so more comprehensive genetic tests need to be performed. So the, oi. So the initial strategy of having serial biomarkers being provided, being tested, clearly had um, an effect on the number, I hope you can see the numbers here, um, the, but just by the color of this um, pie, you clearly see the number of unclassified cases that we had around to, to 2014. It was close to 75% of the cases were unclassified. But as soon as we introduced the more comprehensive analysis using next generation sequencing and the different panels, both for DNA and RNA, this number really crushed down to 40% of the cases, and this clearly had an impact on the outcome of target therapies that could be illegible for the patients. With, you can see here by the green line, the impact on how the patient care was made was very much beneficial for, them, for, 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 for the patients. So by the end of 2014, beginning of 2015, all our somatic tests have just completely moved to next generation sequencing because of, as I said, the comprehensiveness of the tests, because we could use both DNA and RNA to simultaneously look for point mutations in DELs and also for fusions. ALK and ROS were very important at, at this time. And also because doing this would also decrease our internal costs. So we are also providing more comprehensive tests at the most cheaper price. Still trying then to further reduce the number of unclassified cases, the world of liquid biopsy came into play. And here, when for tissue accessibility was not possible or if one tissue samples were not available for a given patient, liquid biopsy or the possibility to detect tumor mutations in peripheral blood came as, uh, as an issue and uh, as an alternative. But here there are two issues. It's not only just an issue of having more and more sequencing capacity, so we acquired more sequencers, but this was not just to get more sequencing capacity, but in fact, new assays were needed because to reach the sensitivity and the comprehensiveness of the panels that are required to bring a comprehensive understanding of the genetics makeups of the patients at these levels of sensitivity, the standard uh, NGS panels were not enough. So molecular barcodes came into play, and this is where <coughs> the liquid biopsy suite pot of uh, targeted panels uh, are present. So. <coughs> This led us to implement a validated routine in the lab <clears throat> that went all the way from how blood was being collected from the patients, how plasma and cell-free DNA was being isolated from the plasma collected from the patients, to the specific panels that were available with the molecular tags that allowed the sensitivity, the needed sensitivity to be present there, all still under the ISO 15189 accreditation. <clears throat> this was then within the ONCO network was benchmarked against different um, uh, providers in the, uh, that are present in the market. And as you see here, um, at least we can say that the test that we have running now in the lab is at least the same quality or the same capacity as the commercial ones, but you can clearly see that for some particular situations, the test that we have is really bringing better sensitivities and, um, and specificities in particular, in particular scenarios. Needless to say that it's a fraction of the cost, that this cost compared to the other the third providers. 
What does this allow us? This allows us now to have more than 200 um, cancer patients that are being followed up very close together with one of the general hospitals that we have close by our research. Uh, institute where we are now or, um, um, prospectively monitoring these patients, not only using the standard um, imaging technologies, but also now using molecular pathology, liquid biopsy testing, to, to, to try to understand uh, the, the, the value of now implementing this in the routine not only to allow us in this, for example, in this particular case, what type of resistance mutation were present, but also to detect that the, 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 the relapse of the patient could be earlier detected by using liquid biopsy, either in this very typical EGFR mutant case where the T790M mutation was present there very early before the imaging was there, but also in other types of lung cancer, in other types of therapies that are now bringing, being brought up into, into play that this methodology can also be implemented. Not only in lung, but nowadays we are also approaching other tumor models. Breast cancer is one of my um, next in line, not only because there are standard therapies already in play, but very much with the new target therapies that are now being brought into the market that I do really see them as having a very important play for breast cancer monitoring. Not only resistance, but also for um, therapy um, selection. <clears throat> so, where are we now? So, this is where we are now. What NGS brought us, gave us, to the lab was this sort of, uh, this sort of um, conclusions. First, our aim was to decrease time to diagnosis. And if you compare here, just by doing, um, introducing next generation sequencing into, into, into our lab, we managed to reduce our turnaround time from 15 days to 10 days. So which is 33% reduction, which clearly is a good sign for making clear decisions or more informative decisions for therapy selection for the oncologists. Not only that, but by doing a more comprehensive analysis, we really decreased the unclassified cases. So we increased, in fact, our diagnostic yield in more than 50%. So more patients are being selected for better therapies, for more informative therapies for those specific um, um, patients. All this by still having capacity to do more and more cases. So more cases are being performed more comprehensively and in a much more reduced time. Not only now using fresh um, uh, paraffin samples, but also the possibility of doing the exact same tests on plasma sample is a reality. Both tests under the same qualities and under the same accreditation um, um, level. To sum up, this is a bit the message that I wanted to bring to you. So much during this time has changed. The complexity of workflows, the capacity of throughput, data analysis, data interpretation, and the, the need for special equipment with time, this has been all sort of sorted out. Now I think it's the time that it's us that we need to challenge the technology. So this is the time where the technology need, really needs to serve us. And what we need is to challenge it. This is just a list of things that I came up with that I would think as an ideal scenario. The ideal scenario is what we call a black box. You put it in DNA and you get the report out. This is an ideal scenario, as long as you know that things are done under control, that it's validated for different types of samples, biological samples, and also for the different types of variants that are needed to make proper diagnosis. And also that allows us to use different sizes of panels according to the questions that one has. <clears throat> Tumor-specific panels, I think, are still needed so that we can do fast routine testing for the specific tumor models that are required, but also pan-cancer panels with a much more broader um, capacity to more comprehensively analyze, for example, um, uh, in cases of primary of unknown location to try to get a more informative information on those cases, these bigger panels might be um, a, a solution there. So with this, of course, this has been, a lot of people have been involved, not only from my side, from the hospital, but also a lot of 
people within Thermo Fisher have been involved in the development of this. And with this, I leave you to think. What would you consider that you can answer the question now? Are we ready or not? <laughs>